very first gospel, the 18th chapter of that first gospel. In just a moment, we're going to begin reading with verse 23. On Sunday morning, we're in a sermon series going through the summer entitled Questions and Answers. You ask the questions, and I let the Bible answer them. For every Bible question, there is a Bible answer. The question this morning, how can I forgive others? How can I forgive others? Matthew 18, we're going to do a little bit longer scripture reading than I normally do. Because Jesus is going to tell a story. His stories were called parables. Parables are an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. In other words, they have a double blade, you might say. One side is the earthly story, the other side is the eternal story. Jesus' story, beginning in Matthew 18, verse 23, a parable, a story on forgiveness. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Since he could not pay, his master, his king, ordered him to be sold, his wife to be sold, his children to be sold, all that he had to be sold, and payment to be made toward this $25 million, 10,000 talent debt. So the servant fell on his knees, begging the king, Have patience with me, please. I will pay you everything. And the king, out of pity for him, the master of that servant, released him and forgave him the entire debt. That's a pretty good story so far, isn't it? Particularly if you're the one who stole the money. But let's go on. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him. And he hollered and screamed at him, Pay what you owe me! Pay what you owe me! So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, I will pay you. But he refused to have patience on him. And he went and put him in prison until he should pay that debt of ten, or excuse me, one hundred denarii. When his fellow servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported all that they saw and heard to the master, to the king, at what took place. Then the servant's master summoned him back and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. You should... And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? In anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all of his debt as well. So also my heavenly Father will do every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. One of the foundational doctrines... One of the bedrock doctrines of the Christian faith is forgiveness. I want you to think with me because there's two types of forgiveness. First of all, there's vertical forgiveness. The kind of forgiveness that God gives us when He forgives us of our sins through Christ Jesus. That's vertical forgiveness. God forgives us of our sins against Him, our wrongs against Him, our wickedness against Him. He forgives us, He saves us, He washes us, He cleanses us, He makes us whole, He makes us new. And then there is horizontal forgiveness. Horizontal forgiveness is the 
forgiveness that we extend to one another this way. Because we have been forgiven vertically, we forgive others horizontally. And when we do that, we receive not just heaven, but we receive heaven down here. There's many Christians who are going to heaven, but they're going to hell to get there. When God forgives us this way, and we extend that forgiveness this way, not only do we have heaven in eternity, but we have heaven on earth, because we are filled then with the peace and joy of God. Some of you are Christians here. Some of you are going to heaven here. But you have no peace. You have no joy. You have no hope. Life is miserable for you. You're frustrated. You're aggravated. As I said earlier, you're going through hell down here to get to heaven up there. And God doesn't want that. The same way God forgave us, we're to forgive others. If we refuse to do it, he can't save us. If we refuse to do it, He can't give us His peace and joy. And He won't give us His peace and joy. So the story that Jesus tells is in response to the Apostle Peter. Peter was always asking questions. He comes to Jesus and he says, Lord, I've got somebody who's just flat out aggravating to me. They call me names, they throw rocks at me, they pick at me, they hit me occasionally. I'm sick and tired of it. Lord, how many times must I forgive them? I believe it's just seven because seven's the number of God, right? Just seven on the eighth time I can knock the daylights out of him. Jesus says, no, Peter, not quite. You're to forgive those who talk about you. You're to forgive those who, who harass you. You're to forgive those who pick at you and hurt you and abuse you and make your life miserable. You are to forgive them seven times 70. And so Peter says, that's 490. He was a math major. He said, I need to run down to the electronics store. I need to get me one of those handheld calculators. And I'm going to start keeping up with this guy. When he calls me a name, bing! When he makes my life miserable, bing! When he hurts me, bing! I'll give him 490 because that's what Jesus said. But at 491, <laughs> I'll get him. Jesus says, that's not what I'm talking about either. I'm not talking about a specific number of forgivenesses. I'm talking about forever forgiveness. Ongoing, progressive, continual. Has no limit, has no ending. You see, that's our story. We're fine when it's about Peter, aren't we? But now it's about us. Have we accepted this forgiveness? Have we brought our wrongs and wickedness to the Lord? Have we accepted His forgiveness that He could save us? Well, if we have, do we not owe that forgiveness this way and that way? Sure we do. And that's what the story is all about. I'd like to go back through the story with you. I'm going to contemporize it a little bit for you. I'm going to... In I won't say embellish it, but I'm going to throw a little Jim Palmerism at you through it. I'm not going to damage the story, but I'm going to just retell it a little bit. And then once you really understand it, then I'm going to give you six principles, and we'll go eat some barbecue. How's that? Let's go back through the story. Now, you can keep your Bibles open, Matthew 18. We're going to again pick up with verse 23. A servant has stolen some money from the king. He didn't borrow it from the king. He stole it from the king. He was in charge of some of the king's treasury. And so this servant who had this great responsibility, this great 
duty, he decides to help himself to some of the king's revenues. And he helps himself to $25 million of revenue. That's what 10,000 talents are. $25 million he has put in his pocket. And he's used it to buy a big house. He's used it to buy a vacation house. He's used it to buy a Corvette. He's used it to buy a Porsche. He's used it to buy some nice Italian suits. He's used it to buy some nice filet mignons. He's spent the money. And an audit's done of the king's revenue. It comes up that this servant stolen $25 million. The king calls the servant and demands, where did that money go? I want that money back. $25 million, the king says, I want back from you. And I want it right now. And the servant says, sweating bullets. I don't know what to tell you, king. I don't know why I did it. I shouldn't have done it. I know I shouldn't have done it. But one dollar led to two, and two led to four, and four led to eight, and I just I couldn't stop. I've spent every bit of it. I don't have any of it left. So the king says, well, that be the case, you're going to jail. I'm going to sell your wife into slavery and get what I can out of her. I'm going to sell your children into slavery. I'm going to get what I can out of them. I'm going to sell your family, your aunts, your uncles, your grandchildren, your nieces and nephews. I'm selling them into slavery. And I'm going to take all of that money and ply it toward your $25 million debt. And by the way, I'm taking back the deed and title of that house you got. I'm getting the, the titles on those automobiles you got. I'm cleaning out your checking account and savings account. It's now mine. I'm taking that jewelry you bought your wife and those clothes you brought yourself. And I'm getting your freezer and I'm taking out those steaks. I'm taking everything you got. Until I get my money. And the servant falls on his knees before the king. And with tears in his eyes he said, would you forgive me? I beg your forgiveness. I plead your forgiveness. I'm sorry for all this wrong I've done. I'm sorry for this wickedness. I'm sorry for this crime. I knew I shouldn't have done it, but I did it. I have no excuse. I have no alibi. I have no one to blame. I have no defense. Oh, king, just forgive me. You're a gracious, merciful king. Would you forgive me? Please, please, give me another chance. And the story tells us that the king was moved with compassion. The king wasn't a hard man. He was a fair man. And here's this servant on his knees, weeping profusely, begging for his life, begging for his family, begging for a new chance, a second start. And so the king says, okay, you're forgiven. I'm wiping $25 million off the books. You're forgiven. Don't worry about your family. I pardon them. Don't worry about yourself. I forgive you. Go. Pretty good so far, isn't it? Now you would think this servant would be appreciative of somebody showing him such gratitude. Such kindness, such goodness. But that's not what the story says. The servant who was so given, forgiven so much, he walks outside and he's on his way home. And he notices, aha, there's that person over there that I loaned some money to three weeks ago. They didn't have no lunch money and they came to me. And I gave them $10. I sent them to McDonald's with $10 and they got them a hamburger, a half fries, and a bottle of water. Can you still get that there now? I want my money back. 
Three weeks, ten dollars, I want it back. And so he goes up to the man, this servant who has been so royally forgiven. And he grabs him by the neck. Doesn't even give him a chance to say anything. Grabs him by the neck, shakes him, maybe slaps him a little bit. And he says, I want my ten dollars right now. I want it. And if you don't give it to me, I'm going to rough you up some more. I'm going to call the police. I'm going to press charges. I'm going to put you in jail. And you'll stay there until you rot. Unless I get my $10. Well, The other servant said, I don't have it. I'm sorry, I don't have it. I had some medical bills and I had to pay those. And I have children issues that I had to help them. I, I just don't have it. Sir, can you not show me compassion? I beg you, I plead you, I'm on my knees, I'm crying before you. Would you just please give me some time on this ten dollars? Would you show me grace? Would you show me mercy? Would you show me grace? Would you show me mercy? Would you? No. Pay up now or go to jail. I don't have it. Go to jail. Now the king heard about this. So he calls the servant that he forgave $25 million for. Back to before him. And he says, I withdraw your pardon. You will pay the $25 million. I withdraw your family's pardon. They will be sold into slavery. I will get what I can out of them. I'll apply it towards your debt. You are going to jail. And you will stay in that jail. And you will rot in that jail till I get my money. Take him away. Take him away. Now that's the story. What does it mean? Well, the king is the Lord, is he not? You've got to identify who the, the cast of characters are in the story. The king is the Lord. The servant who stole the $25 million and committed this wrong, this wickedness, this crime, this corruption against the king, Guess who that is? Hold your finger up. Get him up. Now turn it to you. <laughs> That's you. That's me. We've committed wrongs against King Jesus. We've committed crimes against King Jesus. We've committed sins against King Jesus. We've run up a sin debt of $25 million of sin. And yet we came to him on our knees and we begged him and we pleaded him. We called upon his name and he forgave us of those sins. All of them. A blanket pardon for every sin we'd ever commit. He did it in grace. He did it in mercy. He did it in goodness. He did it in kindness. He did it out of love. He gave us forgiveness and he saved our soul. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, In Him we have redemption through His blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. Wow. Are we not like that wicked servant? We take... $25 million of forgiveness from God. He gives us a pardon. He gives us freedom. And then one of us comes to one of us and says, you said something that hurt me. You did something that hurt me. If 
but I'm not, I'm not hating you for it. I'm not going to hurt you back in exchange. I forgive you. What you said hurt, but I forgive you. My $10 hurt, I can forgive you for. I can forgive you for this. I can forgive you for that. Because the Bible says, forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who what? Trespass against us. So that's the characters of the story. The king is the Lord. The debt is our sin debt to him. The pardon, the forgiveness, is what he gives us when he saves us. And for some of us, it was a lot more than $25 million, I might add. And when we're saved, he wants us to take this forgiveness that he has so freely showed us and extend it this way. I forgive you, you forgive me. You forgive them, them forgives you. Does that make sense? And yet we have some of you sitting here right now looking at me. You've accepted the salvation, the vertical forgiveness of God. You've been forgiven for $25 million of sin debt. But you're looking at me right now and somebody said something about you. Somebody did something to you. Somebody should have not did this, should not have done that. And you're sitting here right now. You hate them for it. You talk about them. You would give them back if you could. You revenge. You're vindictive. You're spiteful. You would curse at him if you could. You'd stick your middle finger up at him if you could. You'd slap him if you could. You are just intensely angry with them. And you won't let it go. And for some of you, it's been going on for one year, five years, 15 years, 30 years. You accepted $25 million of forgiveness this way, but you won't give $10 of forgiveness this way. And you wonder why you you're not have no peace in your Christian life, no joy. Pastor Jim talks about peace and joy. I don't know what in the world he's talking about. I've never had it. It's because you don't practice it this way as you received it this way. Let me give you six quick principles and we're out of here. These principles flow out of our story. Some of them come from other places. But just some principles. I want you to, as the cow would, chew the cud a little bit on these. Because I remember, this is not just Jesus speaking to Peter. It's Jesus speaking to you. He's speaking to me. He's speaking to this church on the subject of forgiveness. First of all, principle number one. Forgiveness is mandatory. If you are going to be saved, first of all, and have joy, second of all. Forgiveness is not optional. Forgiveness is mandatory. I'm a sinner. I have sinned against God. My sins are wrong. My sins are wicked. My sins are many. My sins were intentional. I have no defense. I have no excuse. I have no one to blame. I did it because I wanted to do it. It's my sin. And Lord, I'm sorry. Save me, Lord. Save me, Lord. Give me your grace. Give me your mercy. I beg of you, Lord, save me. And he saves us. He saves us. And that salvation he gives us through involves forgiveness of our sin. And it puts us in heaven one day. That forgiveness is mandatory if we're going to be saved. We have to be forgiven to be saved. But when we are saved, then we are heaven born and heaven bound. And then as we take this forgiveness, which is mandatory to be saved and go to heaven, we extend it this way, which is mandatory if we want to have heaven on earth before we go to heaven up there. Because every time I forgive you, 
God is going to give me peace. Every time you forgive me, he's going to give you joy. So is it possible to be saved and go to heaven? Absolutely. But forgiveness is the reason why. Is it possible to be frustrated, aggravated, miserable, full of hatred, full of vindictiveness, and still go to heaven? Absolutely. And there's many Christians who are. Because they will not forgive. As long as you want to hold that grudge, you can hold it. And you'll go to heaven with a poochy lip. And your shoulders down, shuffling your feet. Going through hell down here before you go to heaven up there. All because you won't forgive. You will not forgive. So principle number one, forgiveness is mandatory. This way if you want to be saved. This way if you want to have peace and joy. It's mandatory. There's no option. There's no alternative. There's no multiple choice. Principle number two. Forgiveness is ongoing and unlimited. As we talked about earlier, Peter thought it was seven times, then he thought it was 490 times. What Jesus was trying to teach him is, it's not a number of forgivenesses that we can count. It's a number of forgivenesses that is endless. Pastor, how, long, how many times must I forgive? 500 times, Pastor? Would that cover it? 15,000 times, Pastor. There's no number. It's unlimited. As long as you have breath down here, you forgive. I forgive. You understand that? It's progressive. It's continual. It's unending. It's unlimited. We practice it continually. Thirdly, forgiveness has a supernatural origin. It comes through God's Spirit. Forgiveness this way has a supernatural origin. It comes from God. When we receive this forgiveness that is vertical from God, He comes into our life. I am crucified with Christ, but nevertheless I live. But it's not I that live anymore. It's Christ who is living His life in me and through me for His glory. So forgiveness has a supernatural origin. You cannot forgive as God forgives until you become a child of God. Once you're saved, Washed and cleansed and made whole, set free, new life, new beginning. Once you've received this forgiveness and the Spirit of God who gives you that forgiveness comes and lives inside of you, you then are able to extend that forgiveness to other people. I was reading the story and preparing for this of a woman whose husband left her. Left her for a younger woman left her with bills, left her with three small children that were still in diapers, left her for a younger woman, just took off and left. Not a goodbye, not a see you later, no money to help out. Adios, I'm out of here. She was filled with hatred. Every second of every minute of every hour of every day of her life. Every time she thought of her husband. Every time she saw him in her mind. Every time she saw anything that reminded him of her. She was filled with hatred. She was filled with anger. She wanted to kill him. She wanted him dead. She thought about all the different ways she could pay him back. Be vindictive. Be spiteful. Get revenge. And it made her a horrible person. She said, I was a monster. But then it changed. Just like that. What changed? She took a pill, right, Pastor? They got a pill for everything. 
She got some therapy. She went to a program that could help. She found another man. You know what changed? You know what got the hatred out of her? The spitefulness out of her? The bitterness out of her? What was destroying her and not touching him at all? And was destroying her children? You know what got it out? Jesus Christ. The day came when she gave her life to Jesus. And all of a sudden that hatred turned to forgiveness. And that desire for revenge turned into a love of I'm sorry for him. I'm sorry for him. And I hope one day he'll get saved and see what he did. You see, Jesus makes a difference. When you have him this way, you can do it this way. But if you don't have him this way and never have received it from him, you have nothing to offer to anybody else. Fourthly, I want you to listen carefully to this because it's really a threefold principle rolled into one. Forgiveness is not about forgetfulness. See, many Christians think, I've got to forget in order to forgive. No, you don't. Forgiveness is not about forgetfulness. It's not about reconciliation with the person who offended you that you're forgiving. It's not about letting people off the hook. Are you listening to? You got your ears on. Forgiveness, biblical forgiveness, is not about forgetfulness. Only God can forgive and forget. Only God has a sea of forgiveness and a sea of forgetfulness that flow together into the same river. We cannot forget. I'm sorry you cannot forget. What was said to you, what was done to you, whether it was once or 15,000 times, it's right there. It will always be right there. It's right here. It will always be right here. You cannot flush it out of your mind and heart. But listen to me. You can quit thinking about it. You can quit talking about it. You can quit living about it. And that's what forgiveness is in the Bible. This way. We let it go. I'm not going to get around people and bring it up again. I'm not going to get around people and think about how I can be vindictive or, or, or spiteful. We just stuff it. And we let God deal with it. So you can forgive somebody. But don't expect it to go away because it's not going to go away. It will be there. And sometimes it'll be difficult, but that's okay. You just don't talk about it. You don't act it out. You don't seek revenge. You just let it go. Secondly, forgiveness is not about reconciliation. If you're my friend and you stab me in the back and twisted that blade, I can forgive you for that. By His grace and mercy, through His Spirit, I may not forget it, but I can forgive you. I may not be your friend ever again, but I can forgive you. Forgiveness doesn't mean I will befriend you again. It doesn't mean that I will allow you into my inner circle again. It doesn't mean that I will trust you. It just simply means I'm letting it go. I can wave at you. I can smile at you. I can shake your hand. I can pat on your back. I can be in a crowd with you. And it'll, everything will be polite and cordial. But the relationship that we once had may not ever come back. But that's okay. It doesn't have to. You got that? Because I had a lady one time come to me and said, I don't know that I can have a relationship with my father after what he's done to me. I said, you may not. And maybe you shouldn't. There's nowhere it says in the Bible you have to go back 
and subject yourself to possible what you did subjected yourself to before. You can forgive from a distance. Thirdly, it doesn't mean letting people off the hook. If somebody does something to you that is unbiblical, immoral, or illegal, you have every right to press charges and should press charges if the law has been broken. The fact that I forgive them does not mean I'm letting them off the hook to abuse somebody else or to continue to try to abuse me. I'm not going to allow that. I'm not out to hurt them. I'm not out to spite them. I'm not out to pay them back. But I'm out to serve justice. I'm out to serve justice. In fact, you owe it to other victims. If you have been victimized by somebody, yes, you can forgive them. But it doesn't mean you'll forget. It doesn't mean you'll ever be close to them ever again. And it doesn't mean you're letting them off the hook for what they did to you just because you forgive them. You can forgive and still demand that justice be done. Does that make sense to you? Shake your heads. Fifth principle. Revival cannot happen in a church or in a Christian until the spirit of unforgiveness is dealt with. We wonder why there's no revival in this church, perhaps. We wonder why there's no revival in churches out there. We wonder why there's no revival in our own personal lives. I wonder, just wonder, it's because we harbor unforgiveness in ourselves. We're angry, we're bitter, we're negative, we're spiteful, we're vindictive, we want to pay back somebody, we want to get even with somebody. It consumes our mind, it consumes our heart, it consumes our words, it consumes our actions. And we wonder why the Spirit of God has no freedom in a place like that. Revival comes not when we come to the altar. Not when we come to the altar. Revival comes when we go to the cemetery and we dig a hole. And we take our unforgiveness and we put it in that hole. We take the hatred of it. We take the, the, the vileness of it. We take the abuse. We take everything that was said, everything that was done. We pile it in that hole. We cover it up. We wash our hands of it and we leave and never come back. I call it forgetfulness, forgiveness cemetery. We take those things that we cannot forgive and we bury them. And we don't go back. We don't get a shovel and go back there and dig it back up again. <laughs> Lastly, you can't go back. You can't. You can't stay here. You can't. You got to go forward. So how do we go forward? Can't go back. What's done's done. Can't stay here because tomorrow's coming quickly. We got to go forward. This verse to take with you. Be kind and be compassionate to each other. 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 Forgive each other just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Be kind, be compassionate to one another. Why? Because you have been forgiven a debt of $25 million by the king. He did it for Christ's sake. Can you not forgive somebody for $10 of wrong? For the same sake of Jesus? You say, I can't do it. I cannot do it. Yes, you can. You know how? Practice makes perfect. 
Just keep doing it till you get good at it. Because it might be rough for a while, but it'll, you'll get better at it, I promise you. And the more you get better at it, the more peace you'll have, the more joy you'll have, the more you'll see that your anger against that person didn't really do anything for you and did nothing against them. Forgiveness. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed.